We continue now with a reading from Matthew's Gospel, the 18th chapter, verses 21 through 35. Then Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of the, that slave released him and forgave the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then this fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went out and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Second only to Jesus Christ, the Apostle Peter is my favorite character in all of Scripture, mostly because he just comes so close so many times to getting it right only then to fall on his face. We are familiar with some of Peter's foibles. Just a few weeks ago, we read the story of the Transfiguration where Jesus takes Peter and John up the mountain. And Peter, so overcome by the grandeur of what he sees, the prophet Elijah, together with Moses, the great leader of the people, suddenly starts to say, Jesus, Jesus, should I build us some houses so we can stay here? until the voice of God has to say, Peter, Peter, just listen. We know that Peter will soon come to the time when he denies even knowing our Lord after promising that no matter what, he would follow him to the end, even if it meant his own death. And just before the passage that we read today in Matthew's Gospel, in the 16th chapter, Jesus says to Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter absolutely gets it right. He says, you are the son of the living God. And Jesus said, now that is a rock that I can build a kingdom on. And so now that Peter knows who Jesus is, knows what is going to happen, he says to him, this is what will happen. The Son of Man will be killed. And Peter says, Lord, don't say that. I don't want to hear it. And yet again he falls. And Jesus says to him, Peter, 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 get behind me, Satan. And then the story that we read today. Peter goes to Jesus, having known fully who he is, knowing what is coming, and says to him, if someone in the church, which is not the correct translation, it's more, if my brother or sister sins against me, how many times should I forgive? As many as seven times. We need to understand something about numbers in scripture. Numbers have great meaning. The number seven, the number of days in creation, followed by the day of rest. It's a number with significance. It's also a pretty large number if you're going to forgive someone. Because in the tradition of the rabbis of that time, to forgive someone once was commendable. To forgive someone twice was really going the distance. To forgive someone three times was considered excessive. And so Peter, thinking that he has a grasp on what Jesus is trying to teach him, says as many as seven times. Imagine his dismay when Jesus says, 77 times. And as Jesus often did, when you ask him a question, he's going to tell you a story. And there we get the parable known as the parable of the unforgiving or the unmerciful servant. It's hard for us to understand the numbers in scripture and also the designations of talents. 
A talent is not a coin. It's not a bill. It's not a piece of currency. It's a weight, a measure of weight. So we're talking about a weight of gold or precious metal that is so large we cannot even begin to imagine. If you worked 150,000 lifetimes, you could not come up with this kind of money. So when Jesus tells stories, they often have an element of the ridiculous in them, the hyperbole that is common to that era and that way of telling stories. We miss that unless we pay careful attention. Jesus is saying there once was a king, there was a nobleman, and he had more money than anyone could ever dream of, and he lets his servant borrow it, his slave. There is no way in the world that a master with that kind of wealth would entrust so much to a slave. And he has to pay back what he owes. He can't begin to pay it back, but when it's demanded of him, what does he ask for? More time, if I had a little more time, if I had a little more time, that's like borrowing $300,000 to buy a house. You miss the first payment. You go to the bank and you say, I am sorry I missed my mortgage payment, but by next week I'll be able to give you the entire $300,000 with the interest. Something that could not happen. Something that wouldn't happen. And yet he is forgiven the entire debt. But immediately his fellow servant comes to him who owes him a small amount of money, not an insignificant amount of money. He owes him about three months' worth of wages. And he says, if you just give me time, I could repay the loan. And that is a debt that could be repaid. But his servant, friend, says to him, no, I demand it right now, and has him thrown into prison until he can pay the entire amount. Now, what's the problem with that situation is that if you're in prison, you cannot make money you cannot pay the debt, and so he will stay there forever, it seems. Then Jesus looks at Peter and says words that still are hard for us to hear today. So my heavenly Father will not forgive you if you do not forgive others. Because what happens? Other servants see what has happened, and they go and they tell the king what this servant whom he has forgiven has done. And he calls him before him, and he throws him into prison where he will be tortured. Now, we don't want to take this too literally, as in, if you don't forgive, you're going to go to hell. And that's how a lot of people take it. We've been studying the book Amish Grace, although we've not been able to study together. People have continued to read the book. This is one of the foundational passages for the Amish community, just as the Lord's Prayer is. Because what do we pray every time we pray the Lord's Prayer? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And I said, if we say it in the opposite, it's harder to hear. Forgive me, Lord, but only to the degree that I'm willing to forgive someone else. Or better yet, Lord, if I won't forgive, I don't want you to forgive me. That's what we're hearing today, the exact opposite of what we pray in words. But the meaning is exactly the same. What we're saying here is we will not be forgiven if we cannot forgive. That is the Amish theological take on this, which is why they are able to forgive, which is why they practice forgiveness so dearly from the time they are children until the time they are adults, and that is why they are able to forgive the man who murdered their children. There's another way to look at this, though, and that has something more to do, I think, with Peter. Peter almost gets it right, and I think we almost get it right ourselves sometimes when it comes to forgiveness. That is, if we understand how deeply God has forgiven us our sin, how can we possibly withhold forgiveness from someone else? That's what this whole series on forgiveness has been about, about how is it that we can, in light of the cross of Jesus Christ and what we owe him, a debt we could never repay, a debt we could never hope to repay because our sin and our brokenness with God is something that we can never earn back. That's why we call it grace. Grace, an undeserved, an unmerited gift. God's love reaching through our sinfulness, claiming us as his own, and bringing us home. Something we could not achieve on our own, but that is freely given. That is why grace is such a beautiful and powerful word. And it's such power in our lives as God's people in Jesus Christ. So who do you need to forgive? I asked you that at the beginning of Lent. 
Who do you need to forgive and what are you going to do about it? It's an act of will. We cannot wait until we feel like forgiving, until it feels good, which means sometimes we will be called upon to forgive those who don't deserve it, who haven't asked for it, who haven't repented. But that is what God in Jesus Christ offers to us, new life, new hope, a new chance to move forward. We need to say a little too about what forgiveness is not. It is not a magic wand that you wave over a situation. It is not forgetting the wrong that has been done to you. It's not even the same as pardon and reconciliation. Forgiveness is letting go of your need for retribution, your need for revenge, your need for payback, your need to demand from the other what they have taken from you. It's also about giving up anger. We read the beautiful passage from Ephesians that John shared with us about not letting the sun go down on our anger, not letting anger build into resentment and bitterness in us so that we are not able to forgive what has been done to us. The only way to do this is to immerse ourselves in scripture. There have been great memes all over Facebook. My favorite has been, I always thought if I had time I would clean my house. I found out now it has nothing to do with time. We have the opportunity now to read scripture and some of you have taken that opportunity. Some of you are at home spending some good quality time with your Bible every day. Some of you have increased your prayer lives, and others of you have been saying to me, I really thought if I had time to read the Bible, I would, but just like housework, that doesn't seem to be the issue. But I do hope you've taken the time during these weeks of Lent and these weeks where we've been in isolation to remember to pray for God's healing grace to come into your heart, to weed out all the animosity and bitterness and resentment that is there. We have to be careful, too, I said. Forgiveness is not the same as pardon and reconciliation. To forgive someone who abuses you does not mean that you continue to be abused. One of the greatest fears that mental health professionals have had is that with people being at home, whether quarantined or just avoiding others by social distancing, there are many people who are locked into a house with their abuser right now. We're not talking about abuse that continues. We're not talking even about pardon, although this story talked about pardon in a very real way, meaning that the debt was wiped away. There are debts that have to be paid according to the legal system. Pardon has a very specific meaning, as does reconciliation, which means the restoration of a relationship. Some people feel that they can't forgive someone who perhaps has died because that person is no longer here. But forgiveness is a way to heal yourself as well as the situation. You can forgive someone who doesn't ask for it. You can forgive someone who doesn't deserve it. You can forgive someone who doesn't even want it. You can forgive someone who has died because we have the act of will in God, in Jesus Christ. It's not easy, but it is a process that begins when we look into the depths of our own hearts. Lent calls us to a season of self-reflection to a season of examining our own brokenness. And in that way, we are able to receive God's grace in a new and powerful way. I promise you, if you can find the strength through the power of the Holy Spirit at work in your heart to forgive someone else, you will free yourself. Several weeks ago, I said what was absolutely true and continues to be true, withholding forgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. So especially in these difficult days when we don't know for sure what lies ahead, I hope you will take seriously these teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we grow closer to the time of his passion, that you remember that from the cross, he forgave those who put him there. That's you, that's me, that's each of us. So that together we might work toward learning the grace that saves us and makes us whole. It is not easy to forgive. It's impossible sometimes to forget. But through the grace of God in Jesus Christ, all things are possible, even letting go of the hurt that has been done to us so that we might turn to the world in the fullness of joy that is ours in Christ Jesus. If you're able to let that go, I promise you an Easter of unequaled joy. Whether we are celebrating it this way, by camera and remote, or when we come together again, every time we gather, every Sunday is a little celebration of Easter. We will celebrate again. 
because Christ who came, Christ who died, Christ who was raised will come again in the fullness of time. Until then, we are called to live according to his word, according to his grace, and through the power of his Holy Spirit. Amen.